Chapter 17, our next chapter, is entitled Business and the Environment. Some of the things discussed in this chapter I'm going to postpone to future chapters. I'll describe that when I get to those points. One of the main points we made in this chapter is that businesses can potentially gain from being pro-environment. Now, our main paradigm from the very beginning of this course is that businesses won't gain from being pro-environment because of the existence of external costs. One of the graphs we drew had output, uh, output denoted by Q, or quantity, on the horizontal axis. If we have a flat marginal revenue curve, a marginal cost curve like this, and marginal cost plus marginal external cost, then the idea is that the firm doesn't take marginal external cost into account, and therefore the firm wants to produce the profit maximizing point at the profit maximizing point, ma profit maximizing point Q pi, whereas the socially optimal point is Q star, and Q star is less than Q pi. So the whole paradigm we've been using since the beginning of the semester is that firms don't care about the environment. Um, is that completely true? Well, let's go through these these points on the left and discuss each one in turn. The first point is that reducing waste could increase profit. And this is certainly true. I remember listening to a chemical engineer who works for one of the oil refineries in North Salt Lake saying that after air pollution regulations were tightened by the state of Utah, the refinery actually found a way to both decrease air pollution and save money by changing the way it was doing some processes. Now, one could ask if the firm could save money by reducing waste, then, then why wasn't it doing it before? And this, the, the key to understanding this is the neoclassical assumption that firms understand everything about production, and so they're already producing in the most cost-efficient way. That's, in the real world, not necessarily true. And sometimes an increase in environmental regulation can push the firm to do research and development, which it could have done before, but it didn't do before. And that research and development could end up reducing the firm costs. So this can be an effect. Uh, in other words, this can happen in the real world. And the reason is that in the real world, the neoclassical assumption that firms always know everything about the technology and are always minimizing costs, that's not necessarily true. So, to some extent, environmental regulation could push real-world firms to engage in research and development that they wouldn't otherwise do, and actually, say, sometimes, if it's a happy coincidence, save the firms some money. The next point, a green image that is an environmentally friendly image could attract customers and employees. This is true. Uh, and to the extent that it does, we suppose that profit-maximizing firms would want to adopt such an image because that would be profit-maximizing. The thing is that there are presumably marginal external costs, which may not be fully internalized even by a quote-unquote green firm. And to the extent that the even a green firm doesn't internalize all the external costs, there are still some external costs, which means that even for a green firm, they're producing too much output, they're creating too much pollution. Now, there's a question in terms of credibility when one makes the claim that one is a green firm. And this is why I mentioned something about government here. Talk is cheap. If one simply says, oh, I'm an environmentally friendly firm, you might not be telling the truth. And even if you are telling the truth, consumers or potential employees, your intended audience, may not find your claim credible. One of the ways government can help is by regulating these claims. 
as I, I write here, to avoid what's sometimes called greenwashing. Now, you know that uh, whitewashing something it means to cover it up. Uh, so greenwashing is a new word that means to claim that you're environmentally friendly, but really you're not. So to pretend to be environmentally friendly, but not actually being environmentally friendly. If you have a government that can regulate these claims, then when a firm says it's environmentally friendly, the firm can say that in a credible way because if it were lying, the government would take action against it. So firms may need the help of government in order to be able to credibly claim that they're being environmentally friendly. The next point is that some firms are in the business of cleaning up the environment. And obviously these firms benefit from environmentally friendly policies and environmentally friendly legislation. The next uh, point here, getting ahead of environmental regulation. Sometimes it's a good idea for firms, just because they want to maximize profit, to be more green than current regulations require. And this is because they anticipate that there either will be more strict pollution regulation in the future or may be more strict pollution regulation in the future. And sometimes by anticipating this and becoming and reducing pollution more than what you're currently required to, you gain knowledge, insight in terms of how to run your business once the more stringent environmental regulations come into effect. And this could give you a competitive advantage over other firms that weren't forward thinking, that weren't anticipating the tighter environmental regulations. Because when the tighter environmental regulations come, those unprepared firms may have to drastically cut back output in ways that you don't have to because you've already learned how to best operate your business under stricter environmental regulations. This could also be the case for brand new technologies. You could look at the case of Germany subsidizing its wind power industry as, as being something which looks like it costs a lot of money in the short run, because it does cost a lot of money in the short run. But if worldwide environmental regulations on greenhouse gas emissions become much tighter, then Germany and German firms might be in a pretty good situation because they've already developed the ability to produce a lot of power through wind energy, whereas in other countries, uh, for example the U.S., uh, the U.S. might be less well situated in, in a situation where the environmental regulations get tighter because uh, it hasn't anticipated that this kind of change will occur. So all these are situations in which I agree with the book that businesses can potentially gain from being pro-environment. The last point I want to make here is on page 251. This is one of the occasional, very uh, occasional, rare situations in which I am not sure I agree with the way that the book has phrase something at the point that the book is trying to make. So let me read this verbatim from page 251. But the moral case for the environment remains, and it shows through in business approaches to the environment. It shows us commitment, which you might define as a concern for the environment, which cannot be explained in terms of the self-interested motives discussed previously. Proving and measuring commitment are difficult, maybe impossible. But it isn't easy to understand some corporate approaches to the environment unless commitment exists. So let me explain what bothers me about this passage. First off, the point about the moral case for the environment remains. Well, the moral case for the environment underlies, potentially at least, a whole lot of willingness to pay to get more environmental protection. So that the moral case of the environment isn't a surprise. It underlies potentially a lot of the external costs of pollution. Now, 
something which can't be explained in terms of the self-interested motives of business. This I'm much more skeptical about because we've assumed that businesses only care about one thing, profit maximization. This passage it claims that some firms at least care about profit maximization but also about environmental protection and therefore that they're willing to make a trade-off of less profit in order to protect the environment. Now, let's say that's true. So, in other words, we're, we're not in one of these other situations like here where a, a green image could actually improve profits or that you're an environmental cleanup firm or that you're trying to get ahead of environmental regulation or that being environmentally friendly actually increases profit. So let's suppose that none of those are, are true, that you know, that reducing that, that we don't we're not in this situation, we're not in the situation where we're gonna increase profit by increasing our green image, we're not an environmental cleanup firm, uh, we're not trying to get ahead of future environmental regulation. Alright. In in this situation, I, I claim that the firm uh, won't care about the environment. And this paragraph is saying that it might. The even a firm that, that doesn't have all those other motives to care about the environment might, might care about the environment anyway. Well, suppose you had such a firm that is willing to decrease profit in order, both in the short run and in the long run, potentially, in order just to be environmentally friendly. Well, that firm is competing with other firms. And those other firms may not have such scruples. Suppose they don't. Then the firm that's trading off profit for the environment is going to have less profit than the other firm. That means that there's going to be less quote-unquote shareholder value. They may have to charge a higher price to their customers. So the notion is that in in the world of competitive, uh, in the world of competition. Now I don't mean competition in the sense of economic theory, but I mean competition in a more Darwinian sense in the marketplace, where you know, in the real world, we don't have perfectly competitive firms. We have firms that actually do strategically interact with each other, fight against each other. Uh, some of them succeed, some of them fail and go bankrupt. That in this kind of in this kind of scenario, the firm that's not maximizing profit but instead trying to take care of the environment as well is at a disadvantage, and may get run out of business or get bought out by firms that only care about profit maximization because it's that second kind of firm that can undercut the first firm on price and uh, and can uh, be more attractive to shareholders. So the last sentence, it isn't easy to understand some corporate approaches to the environment unless commitment exists. Well certainly in some kind of long-run neoclassical uh, equilibrium, firms that don't care single-mindedly about profit aren't going to survive. But you can argue the real world isn't in a long-run neoclassical equilibrium. And it's in some kind of shorter, non-equilibrium situation in which you can have firms that survive, that do care about the environment in addition to profit, and are willing to trade off some profit in order to be environmentally friendly. I don't think we should count on this. I think it's, it's uh, a safer bet that firms are only acting in their own self-interest and don't care about the environment. But it is, you know, it is possible that you have some disequilibrium situation in which, in which it does. So we'll get to the next point on here, some environmental issues, in the next rather brief video.